The House Rules Committee met earlier today for the second time in as many days to come up with procedures for bringing the controversial Civil Rights Act to the floor of the United States House of Representatives. Just ahead, we will bring you that hearing. House floor debate on the bill was originally scheduled for today, but was put off until Tuesday of next week, while members work on a language in the bill concerning hiring quotas. The president has stated that he will veto any civil rights bill if it has quota language. Each bill that comes to the House floor for a vote must first have a rule which sets procedures for debate on the measure. Earlier today, the Rules Committee said that the civil rights debate would be by the so-called King of the Hill rules, meaning that the last bill to be voted on, if it passes, will be the final version. House Republicans are unhappy with that procedure and said they would challenge the decision next Tuesday on the floor of the House. With that background, we now go to the Capitol building for today's Rules Committee hearing on the Civil Rights Act. Okay. Committee on Rules will uh, come to order. There's been a request for filming of the portions of today's hearing. Without objection, it will be permitted. Uh, the uh, chair is very happy to have once again before it the Honorable Jack Brooks, the chairman, Ham Fish, and Don Edwards. Uh, uh, you gave your testimony yesterday, and uh, we're on the same subject matter. And. Uh, if uh, you have nothing to add or you don't care to add anything, uh, it's, it's understandable. Your name was just put on the bill, Mr. Chairman, because we're still on that same subject matter. And in case you uh, desire to add anything to the testimony you presented before this committee yesterday. Well, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your, you and your committee's assiduous care in evaluating these problems and uh, say that uh, uh, I'll revise and extend my remark, if I may, submit a statement. But basically, objection. we're just here again to ask you to grant a rule that allows uh, the House substitute and the, uh, the Democratic substitute, the, or rather the bipartisan substitute by myself and uh, Mr. Fish, and uh, there may be another substitute, I understand, from uh, Mr. Hyde, and I understand that yeah. I never heard of it before, but there's another substitute that might be considered. But if they all get an hour, uh, that ought to be adequate. And uh, if we get a couple hours or three hours on general debate, I'm satisfied with that. And I just want to tell you, I appreciate you all listening to everybody. And I know there have been a lot of people that have ideas on how this ought to be structured, how it ought to be done. So you know we've been dealing with it for some years now, Mr. Edwards. And and Mr. Fish and myself, and we've heard from a lot of people, and I'm sure that uh, in the last uh, <clears throat> uh, day, you all have had a lot of help offered to you, and I appreciate your resolution of this, and we'd like for you all to continue your uh, discussion and, and give us a rule that we can go to work next week and get it passed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The committee is thinking about three hours of general debate and one hour in each substitute to be equally That's divided. fine. Fine. Your judgment is good. Mr. Fish? Well, on that point, Mr. Chairman, you know, I did ask for uh, a l longer time, both on general debate and on the substitute, because of the importance of this. If it's, if it's you issue. see, we cut it in half between what the chairman asked for and what you asked for. Just wisdom, Solomon, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, well, was Solomon, my Solomon, like Solomon, you Solomon, if you can now. I mean, think what this is going to do to the committee now that we have Solomon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, my understanding was that since we last met, there have been some further uh, amend, amending amendments to uh, Brooks Fish language appearing on page two and again on page four. And if that's uh, one of the matters for consideration by this committee, I just say that I, I don't think they changed the uh, the, uh, the substance, the thrust of, of, of our effort. And I, I'm perfectly happy to accept them. Okay. Mr. Edwards. I have nothing further to add, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the changes that were made uh, yesterday afternoon have to do with clarification. They don't weaken the bill or strengthen the bill, but they made a lot of people feel a lot better. And, and so I think that uh, we're moving along. And uh, thank you for hearing us. Thank you. Mr. Durr. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got a quiz out there. 
Who's got a, a reservation on a plane leaving at 2 o'clock? Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have much voice, so we're going we're gonna to really limit this. For a point of clarification, uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, uh, that we, we know what we, we are going to be voting on. Uh, as I understood, we were going to, instead of having uh, uh, an amendment made in order to the Democrat and Republican substitute, which would have removed caps, I understand now that we're going to have, in effect, three substitutes, that the first one will be the original text of the bill that you put out of your committees. I don't know if it's original. Well, I haven't read it. Okay. I'm, or... I don't guarantee it's the same. Okay, but I understand it's going to... I'm not often. I understand it's going to be either H.R. 1, which was the original text, with the caps removed, or something like H.R. 4000, which was the bill that you put out last year. Uh, then that the that will be uh, the original text that's out there and a vote will come on that first right then the Michael substitute would be considered and a vote would take place on that and then finally the Brooks fish uh, substitute which would be the final vote and that there would be no other amendments allowed but in effect it would be just as if it were three substitutes with the first coming on whatever the original text is or was. Uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be last year's uh, bill without any quotas or without any, uh, any caps, caps, right? Without any caps. Is that your understanding of what's going to, what's going to happen? That's what I, I have a feeling that's what they're okay. planning. Well, then how are the, uh, if we have three hours of general debate, uh, are the three hours going to take place on the, on the original text, Dellums or whoever it's called, then one hour each on, uh, on Michael, and Brooks, or is it going to be three hours of general debate and then one hour on each of the three substitutes? Just trying well, to get it clear. It's going to be, uh, going to be three hours of general debate. The rule would allow, as, as you predicted, would allow three hours of general debate on the um, uh, on the bill. But uh, three hours of general debate, when I make a statement, I want to make a statement that probably will uh, relate more directly okay. to the bill as I want to envision it in final yeah, passage. I understand. And when I recognize people who are against it, they may speak for uh, against the bill in full, or they may speak against uh, the substitutes. People will do what they want. I think they'll discuss the whole thing during general debate. Many people take their time on a given amendment or a substitute during general debate because general debate time is uh, there's more time and availability. Okay, let me Mr. Chairman, I just want to <coughs> clarify one thing. We're going to. <coughs> The original text will be the text that came out of the to Mr. Brooks's committee, right. and last year's bill will be the substitute, be the first substitute that'll be offered by Mr. Towns and Mr. Washington. So that there are, in effect, three substitutes, three substitutes with one hour each on them. So that's, that's six right. hours of total debate. Is what I'm getting. Gentleman's at. right. Gentleman's correct. Okay. Uh, it's uh, said in labor. I'm sorry. It's said in labor's bill that we're making in Otter's original text. Yeah. And, but the substitute, the gentleman is correct, will be the last year, the year, last year's bill. Okay. How, how does that affect uh, our uh, traditional, the uh, minority, uh, the traditional uh, motion to recommit with instructions? We're putting in this Ed and Labor thing now as the original text. Therefore, we have a sub we have a substitute that's going to uh, sur survive. Well, you've well, you got, you got three substitutes. That's my point. Well, you won't have. <coughs> Won't have instruction. They just got three substitutes. <coughs> the emotional recommit. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, I, I think I'm catching. Question's been answered. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm catching his laryngitis, Mr. Billinson. 
Want me to make the motion? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Just bad, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, ask the uh, ranking member to respond. Well, this, the, this, the base bill, I'm, I'm, I mentioned it's an Ed and Labor bill. Uh, who will be handling that during the uh, course of the debate? Well, that was going to be my next question about how we're dividing up this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe All three hours are given to the Committee on Judiciary. We will divide it equally. And it's the and intention the of, the, uh, of the proponents of the <coughs> bill. Let's put it this way. If I'm dividing this time, I'll take an hour and a half, I'll give an hour and a half to Ham Fish. We are both for the bill. We both would allow half of our time to go to opponents, as we always do. Well, you are very gracious, and I knew you were going to say that, and that's what that's I wanted right. to hear you say. Always have done that as a standard right. practice. Okay. I don't have any further okay. questions. Okay. No further questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to thank the chairman and the ranking member for going through the arduous process on this bill and coming up with what I think is a very fair rule. There's been a great deal of concern expressed about the right and ability of members to offer amendments and the Thank you. Ms. Slaughter. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Is you were you were as equally uh, great today as you were yesterday. Well, I might ask him, when, when might this come on the floor today? This be Tuesday. <coughs> the Honorable William Ford. The Honorable Patsy Mink. Do you want to be joined with anybody, uh, Ms. Speaker? Congresswoman Schroeder. Congresswoman Schroeder, the Honorable and Congresswoman Mike Schroeder. Kopetsky. And uh, Mike Kopetsky, the Honorable Mike Kopetsky. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for including us in this uh, final hearing on the Civil Rights Bill. I was unable to make the meeting yesterday. We thought yesterday was going to be the final <laughs> meeting. Well, I'm glad it continued to today because it gives me a, an opportunity to express what I would have said yesterday and which I want to reiterate today, and that is the opportunity we came to request for an up or down vote on the amendment to be offered by myself and Congressman Schroeder to delete from the two substitutes the language which caps damages under Title VII for intentional discrimination. We think that there is a sufficient merit to this issue that it deserves a separate vote. And we are not uh, prepared to give up on this issue and we want to respectfully request that that matter be considered. It is a question of enormous importance to uh, half of the country because the amendment really goes to the women in this country who have up till now been denied the right to claim damages before a court of law for those uh, injuries that they have suffered over and beyond what is determined as equitable remedies, which have heretofore only been limited to reinstatement and back wages. Now when finally there is a chance for equity, and the recognition has been throughout uh, both committees' deliberations, Education, Labor, and Judiciary, that this would be a major breakthrough for women. We even altered the title of the bill to call it Civil Rights and Women's Equity and Employment. That being the case, and this is our one effort to finally achieve a full measure of equal justice before the law, it seems to me unseemly, untimely, and undemocratic to put a limit on the amount of damages that a court of law is going to determine is just and fair. We do not set the damages, the courts do. And why put a lid on what the concept of justice really means. And so I'm here to, again, beseech this committee to give us an opportunity for an up or down vote on this, on this matter. Ms. Schroeder. Well, I, I only join, you heard me yesterday, as I say, we, we have the feeling like the good news of the bill is the women finally get on the bus and the back, bad news of the bill, if we're not allowed to amend it, is we have to go to the back. And that's a very tough position to be in. It's a very difficult thing to sell. 
And it's not just the women we're letting on the bus, the disabled community, um, sections of the religious community. And uh, it seems to me if you're going to get on the bus, you ought to be able to be entitled to any seat on the bus. And we would still truly appreciate some way to try and remove the caps of the final bill. Um, we understand getting to vote for the first bill, but we also understand that it's probably not going to pass. So uh, that's very troublesome to us. Mr. Kapetsky. I could, uh, Mr. Chair, I concur in the uh, statements of Ms. May and Ms. Schroeder. And I would add that what we're there's one option that the members are not going to be allowed to vote on, and that's a proposal that has the benefit of the compromises that have been worked out since the bill has gone out of the Judiciary Committee on which I serve, and not having any caps on it. And it seems to me that fairness dictates that we have that opportunity and quite frankly I have the question in my mind that the fear isn't that it won't uh, pass but that perhaps it will pass. Thank you. Mr. Derrick? No question. Mr. Solomon? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, say to my, my good friends who were testifying, uh, you're going to have that opportunity. Uh, I. I hope that we're going to be successful in the Rules Committee today to uh, change the rule to allow for an open rule which would allow any member of this Congress, all 435 of us, to uh, work our will on the floor. We've always had that historical privilege uh, uh, throughout uh, all of the major uh, uh, civil rights legislation going way back to 1964, up until 1988, up until uh, a couple of years ago uh, when they decided to close down these rules. And I was really disturbed with my good friend, Mrs. Schroeder, uh, who quoted uh, yesterday, and I have the text, Mr. Wheat, of, of, uh, of what she had to say. Uh, Mrs. Schroeder said, as you know, words don't mean what real people think they mean, might mean, when you get into the whole legal trappings. And it goes on and on. And what it said was that people like you and I, Mr. Kapetsky, who <coughs> may not be lawyers, uh, don't have the right or, or the uh, uh, capability of really dealing with it. Yet, back in 1964 and in 1971 and 1976, we all worked our will on the floor of the House, and it came out with some pretty doggone good legislation. So I'm probably going to lose up here, uh, but we're going to have that opportunity because I'm going to lead the fight against this closed rule on the floor of the House. And you're welcome to join me, and we will bring back a rule instantaneously, open rule, which will allow the Schroeder Amendment to be uh, offered, and I would fight to my death to have you offer that amendment and to have you make your arguments on the floor. By the same token, uh, Mr. Grandy wanted to offer an amendment just the opposite of what you wanted to offer uh, in being fair to women, too, because his amendment would have put caps on everything, including race, color, sex, religion, national origin, so that everybody would have been treated fairly. Either you have all the caps or you have no caps. Isn't that fair? So uh, I agree with you 100 percent, and uh, I, am, I, I do thank the, uh, the Rules Committee for not making your amendment in order if they are going to deprive uh, the rest of us of our right to, to have the other side. So, uh, uh, you know, what's fair is fair. Let's be fair. Thank you. Mr. Billison, any questions on the side? Thank you, Mr. May Mr. I uh, make a further comment? Surely. <clears throat> My uh, comment goes to uh, what I understand is already the uh, un, uh, undetermined decision of the committee not to allow us to offer this amendment to the two substitutes. At least in the hallway discussions, uh, this matter has come up, and, uh, and that is why we came to the committee to make one final plea. But if that decision is to be the final decision of this committee not to allow our substitute to be offered to our amendment to be offered to the two substitutes, then I would like to ask this committee to consider an extraordinary uh, amendment to the rule that you are reporting out, which would allow us to offer a motion to recommit, allow two motions to recommit, which I understand from the parliamentarian is possible, that you would allow the motion to recommit to the minority and you would allow a motion to recommit uh, containing uh, our motion to strike from whatever substitute does pass this provision dealing with caps. 
That would give us an up or down vote on the precise issue that you are trying to deny us a right during general debate to offer. But it seems to me that that would be uh, something that is clearly in line with all the discussions and uh, um, uh, discourse that we've had with people that have come up with this rule or this suggested rule and yet end up in a position where we would have the opportunity to offer this motion to recommit with or without instructions. And uh, <clears throat> I've obtained copies of what proposed language would look uh, like and apparently one was offered recently uh, in this Congress having to do with uh, Desert Sh Shield, Desert Storm, and the uh, applicable language is uh, accept two motions to recommit with or without instructions. That would give us an opportunity to offer our language and it would also not deprive the minority of their right to offer their uh, motion to recommit. In this way, the country would have an opportunity in the final analysis after either substitute has been approved to make that one effort to remove this offending language. And I so submit this uh, request to the Rules Committee to give us that opportunity. If we cannot be part of the main debate, give us that opportunity to discuss the matter in the motion to recommit. Mr. Chairman, if I saw, I might, uh, might just respond. Uh, I would just say to the gentlelady that she was a congresswoman years before, I understand too, so she has lots of experience and uh, 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 no challenge was made to the two uh, recommits uh, with instructions at the time and that's, but uh, the rules of the House do not allow that. But if, uh, if my motion, of which I'm entitled to, uh, being in opposition to the rule uh, on the previous question, uh, is uh, uh, voted down and we come back with an open rule, and if that open rule is defeated on a previous question by you, uh, you would then in turn have your, <laughs> your day in court. That's uh, maybe we ought to team up and uh, that's the way we ought to do it. But failing that, if we do come down to two substitutes, both of which contain the offending language, we only ask this committee to give us that one, one final effort in the end to offer a motion to recommit without this language, to strike this language. And I'm told that it, it has been done in the past, there is precedent for it, and you could add the words with or without instructions and it will cover our particular uh, situation. Mr. McCure. Mr. McCure. I'm there, if you have any objections to a letting make the various other amendments that they have suggested here in the last couple of days. Well, I don't, I, I don't uh, know what I will do on that. It depend on what comes out of this committee, I guess. So I, I, I can't make my decision at this point. This is the first I heard of it. We have only been contending with what kind of a rule are we going to get. Well, the expectation is that the rule is going to be limited to brief complete substitute. And the individual amendment will be denied. <coughs> Therefore, the effort to have an open rule could have a series of supporters. Yeah. Yeah. You stood on the yeah. effort. Yeah. So naturally, you had yours included in this motion to recommit, which would give you what you wanted. That's the only thing that you're pursuing. Well, my, my, uh, the effort for an open rule. Okay. my very myopic uh, pursuit right now is the op opposition to the two substitute languages that contain the cap. And I want to pursue that particular um, strategy to find a way to have that removed. However it fits into the strategies that have been devised, that's the end result that I want to accomplish. Well, I spoke yesterday in saying that we're not out for chaos, you know, and this, these are difficult uh, um, decisions that we're talking about. We're talking about Supreme Court decisions. I, w <coughs> I realize that crafting amendments is, is Hard, and I said I didn't want to get in a position where we spent the next 50 years of the court's time trying to figure out what, what we did. Um, now, obviously, I think major amendments should be allowed on specific large issues. Otherwise, we could have a filibuster here that goes on for days and days. We're very interested in getting a bill. We really feel, I think all three of us, very strongly that this country needs these decisions turned around. <coughs> So we would certainly think that this is the kind of bill where a modified open rule is important. But 
a modify rather than just a free for all, I think, is is very uh, uh, the best way to phrase it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know who told you about those two motions to recommit, but it hasn't been done in the lifetime of anybody on this committee. Well, I was told there were, there were at least two precedents within recent times, and I'm be very happy to leave this. No, I understand what you're saying, but uh -huh. I've just conversed with with the council, and uh, if it happened, it happened in back the 50s, but it didn't happen on Desert Storm or Desert Sea Shield. Well, may, I, may I leave this? Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll take it. We'll look yeah. at it because uh, this is the precise language I was handed, and uh, the only word that needs to be changed on the second to the last line is accept two motions to recommit with or without instructions. Oh, we're, and that would we're familiar with the verbiage, uh -huh. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we don't remember the last time it was appended to any place. Well, this is Desert Storm. This is okay. why it's HR 1. It's well, you guys All right, we'll take it. Just look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's get Derek Bull on this point. Yeah. The Honorable Steve Gunderson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm here in particular on behalf of Mr. Goodling, the ranking Republican on education and labor, and also, I guess, on behalf of the Republican leadership to uh, again request. Uh, on behalf of the, the Republican minority that we might be given the opportunity for an open rule. Uh, I understand that uh, the die may or may not be cast, but I would call to the attention of this committee that if our goal truly is enacting a civil rights bill into law, we ought to rethink back a few years ago to immigration legislation. Certainly as controversial, certainly as complex as this legislation is, and if you will recall the history of immigration legislation, it began with the process coming to the floor on an open rule. And yes, we spent a lot of time and a lot of different amendments, but there was a great education process, both in terms of members on the issues and also in resolving some of those particular issues. And sooner or later, we in this Congress are going to have to decide whether we want to enact something into law or on both sides. We want to keep posturing this as a political issue. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to point out to you in the committee, as you consider our request for an open rule, that a quick analysis of the proposed substitute brought to this rules committee yesterday by Mr. Brooks <coughs> indicates that there are 11 major changes to that substitute over the original H.R. 1 that moved through the uh, Education and Labor and the Judiciary Committee. I would point out that three of those are totally new, the anti-quota language, and listen to this. Two more Supreme Court cases are overturned in the Brooks substitute that were not considered in the Judiciary Committee, that were not considered in the Education and Labor Committee. Now, I'm not saying whether that is good or bad. I'm telling you that most members haven't had the opportunity to review those 10 changes, certainly those two new Supreme Courts uh, rulings that have been overturned and ought to have an opportunity to either modify that language or to delete one of those changes if they would so like. In addition to that, we have been told that since the Rules Committee met yesterday that there are two new changes that are going to occur in somebody's substitute here. They were going to change the word substantial to significant and we're going to change the whole uh, wording on the grouping of practices. So we've now gone from 10 major changes to what I assume are going to be 12 major changes without any opportunity for members to become familiar with those changes and try to respond or clarify those changes if they believe it is needed. Add to that the fact that you received le yesterday 11 different requests for amendments, one of which was the substitute, 10 which were specific amendments. We are quickly up to 22 different new elements or requests for consideration. I think if our goal is to truly enact some kind of civil rights legislation, this session is not that late. We're not in October of 1992. There is plenty of time to begin this process in a deliberative way in order to resolve some of these issues and allow us to move forth. So on behalf of our Republican leadership, on behalf of Mr. Goodling and uh, the Republicans on the Education and Labor Committee, we sincerely request of all of you, give our consideration for an open rule, uh, some real thought, because there is some merit on this bill at this time, at this place. Thank you, Mr. Gunnison. Any questions? Of course. Song? Steve, you know my feelings, and we'll help you in every way we can. Thank you. Well said.
Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Craig Washington, the Honorable Dolphus Towns, and the Honorable uh, Congressman Mafumi. Do I, uh, are you all? Are you all on the same? Uh, same one, yes. Sure. Wait a minute, I thought we took care of Quasi. Uh, oh, that was yesterday. Oh, that was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In order to try and uh, uh, consume and cut down the amount of time, we'd just like for Mr. Washington to uh, uh, and uh, to sort of lead off and to speak for the uh, group, and also uh, Mr. Fume, who's also with us here in terms of uh, supporting it as well. So, Mr. Congressman Mr. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, we come before the committee respectfully, uh, asking your indulgence to allow us. Uh, to present as a part of the rule a, a complete substitute, which we think is a more excellent way of addressing on behalf of the Congress the problem that looms that all of us want to solve in the best way possible. What we purport to do with your permission, Mr. Chairman and members, is to offer an amendment uh, which would be made in order, hopefully, by the rule and which uh, you would determine in your wisdom as to where it should be placed among what I can I understand to be several alternative proposals that will be put forward. What we have done uh, in, essentially is to go back to the bill reported from the Education and Labor Committee of the last Congress. Uh, I happen to, uh, I'm privileged to serve my community as a member of the Education and Labor Committee as well as the Judiciary Committee, so I've seen this bill, uh, both the 1990 bill and the 1991 bill through both committees on both occasions. Um, not to say that I'm an expert, but I have become more than intimately <laughs> familiar with the details and nuances of the various proposals. What we have done is to take the bill that was reported from the Education and Labor Committee in the last Congress and to add two provisions which we think uh, make the bill whole. Uh, one provision treats of the question of equal treatment for women, and it takes, quite frankly, a new and different approach uh, rather than to embroil into the middle of the controversy that's presently pending with respect to Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, we've gone back to the 1866 Act, uh, uh, 42 United States Code, Section 1981, and added a separate section, as you members know of the committee, that treats only of um, post-Reconstruction uh, rights for, for black individuals during that period of time after the Civil War. Uh, we have made a parallel uh, provision in our proposed substitute, uh, essentially just taking out the word black and putting in the word women, but frankly doing it the opposite. The, the old statute, as you know, says that rights of black shall be those of white citizens. We say that the rights of women shall be the same as those of male citizens. So that is, I think I have not seen the exact language, but a, probably two or three sentence <coughs> amendment that would specifically make it clear, if adopted by the Congress, that the rights of women vis-a-vis -vis employment discrimination ought to be construed by the courts as being the same as they are for, for male citizens in this country. The other provision uh, is to take a, a, a separate standalone bill that was introduced by Congressman Mfumi, which treats of the subject of a recent Supreme Court decision from this term of court, which uh, narrowly and niggardly, in my judgment, construed the provision with respect to extraterritorial jurisdiction where an employee is hired in the United States and is covered under the ambit of existing laws but works for whatever reason out of this country in another country. And as the committee well knows, the Supreme Court has determined that under those circumstances, a citizen of the United States is not entitled to the privileges and immunities of both the Constitution and of the laws passed by the Congress. We want to make that whole. And we've added that provision to the proposed proposal we have. So essentially, it only contains three things. The bill reported from the Education and Labor Committee last time with two appendages, which would be the equal rights for women, narrowly construed as, as I described, and the provision relating to extraterritorial jurisdiction. We think that um, in this Congress, the members of Congress ought to have an opportunity to vote straight up or down on that question. We understand, of course, it's within the sound discretion of this committee to make that in order or not, and we pray your indulgence that you do so. Thank you very much. Mr. Mofumi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I'll be brief. Uh, I was here yesterday and, and indicated to you at that time that my preference was not the uh, so-called substitute, but rather a much stronger measure. Uh, since that time, having uh, worked uh, both with Mr. Washington and Mr. Towns, 
um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Waters, who is here, and several other members of the, uh, the Congress have fashioned this substitute uh, that we certainly would like to introduce and would ask your permission uh, to be allowed to do so. Uh, we think it addresses the concerns that we have in a very sincere uh, way. It's to the point. And we believe, quite frankly, that when we talk about civil rights, for those of us who, who are most affected, uh, we would rather have the strongest bill possible. And so that is how we have gotten to this point. Mr. Washington and I both served as conferees last year, both serving in the Committee on Ed and Labor, uh, compromised at that time, at least on three occasions with the White House, uh, to change the bill, uh, specifically at the request of the White House, only to come up with, at the, the end of all of those changes, uh, a veto by the President and a failure by the Senate to override. We don't want to be in that position this time, and uh, we want a pure civil rights bill uh, to be offered in the nature of this substitute so that we might be able to vote it up or down and at least give members of this body who feel strongly about that as we do that same opportunity. Uh, we would ask that the committee would grant a, us a rule so that that might be in order uh, to be offered once the debate uh, and the process begins. Thank you. Any questions of the panel? Mr. Frost. Well, first of all, uh, well, you know, on a narrow point, um, will your uh, provision also be included in books and substitutes so that you don't have two shots at that? The provision re relating to extraterritorial coverage under Title VII would be covered in both this substitute uh, and the Brooks substitute. Okay. Um, and I, I'm pleased that that's the case, because as I indicated to you yesterday, I think that you, uh, you raised a very excellent point, something that needed to be addressed. Uh, Craig, uh, I've got a question about, uh, I understand what you've done structurally in terms of amending 1981, and of course, uh, in, title, in, in employment discrimination cases, routinely you plead both. You plead 1981 and you plead uh, Title VII when you, uh, when you file your, uh, your complaint. Um, why, did you, why do you need to amend 1981 if, in fact, wouldn't the original bill take care of this in the context of the original committee bill from last year, take care of this in the context of Title VII? Are you just doing this? Uh, to, to make the statute totally conform, or is there some other reason why 1981 also needs to be amended if, in fact, you go back to the original committee bill on Title VII? That's a good question, uh, Martin. It is my considered judgment that the cleanest and more excellent way of approaching the question of what should be the fundamental rights of women with respect to being free from employment discrimination ought to have been done that way to begin with. Uh, there are a number of remedies, as you know, under Title VII. I wasn't in Congress, neither were you at the time. Uh, in 1964, when the Act was passed, it was a result of a compromise. It was a result of, of many forces that melded together working toward that, that ultimate remedy. Uh, the, the quintessential difference between the old statute and the new statute, in my judgment, is that the, 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 the 1964 Act requires one to go through the Equal Employment Opportunity that's Commission. Uh, the the whole that's correct. Uh, under the, the 19, 42 United States Code, Section 1981, as you know, one does not need pre clearance, so to speak, uh, of the administrative remedy. One can go directly in the court. <coughs> the reason specifically that I did it is because there's a body of case law that has developed over the last 100 years that speaks clearly and succinctly, save one exception, and that was a uh, Patterson versus McLean, if my memory serves me correctly, which was a narrow interpretation by the court that said that the, that statute which guaranteed blacks to be free from discrimination and getting a job did not make them free from getting, from keeping, from discrimination once they receive the job. It's a narrow construction of the word contract. Uh, since there is, in my judgment, a better body of case law already on the books that, that clearly defines what are the rights under the statute. I just mirrored the statute. I did not amend the existing statute because that would be an emotional trauma for some people. This, is, if you will, if it were to pass and become law, 1981 would appear here, section 1977, I believe, of the revised statutes. This one is proposed 1977A, which is identical in, in language except you take out the word black and put in, take out the word white, excuse me, and put in the word male. It's been a while since I've practiced in this area of the law, but I believe you'd still have to plead both because of the attorney's fees. 
Uh, you could, if you'd like to, you could be, but depending on the fact situation, it, it doesn't, it, it's not a panacea to cover every situation, but in my judgment, if I were a woman, I would feel better with that statute than I would with uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, particularly in light of the various nuances and changes that have been proposed, and I don't know where it's going, I don't know where H.R. 1 is going, but if I think that women ought to have a clean shot, and I'm a purist, and I make no no pretenses or excuses for that, uh, I think that women ought to have the same rights as others who have been the victims of discrimination, and the only way to give that to them is to give them the same statutory protection. My question, and I don't want to take any more time, but, but Craig, is, is there, has something developed in recent years? Is there a right to attorney's fees if you just proceed under 1981? There's a right under, under either statute to attorney's fees. What you would do in the pleadings under Title VII is you would plead the statute and then you would plead the Civil Rights Attorney's Fees Act, which is a separate statute. In either case, uh, 1981 carries with it uh, a, a remedy of attorney's fees. The Congress went back and passed, subsequent to 1964, if I remember correctly, the Civil Rights Attorney's Fees Act and incorporated by reference Title VII. This was some time ago that I'm thinking about where you didn't have that right. That's correct. And uh, it's an intriguing approach. Uh, I don't know that realistically that you uh, you will pass your substitute, but I intend to vote for it on the floor. I think it's a clean way, and everybody will know where you stand on the issue once you vote on it. <coughs> uh, one, uh, I have a, c a couple of questions. One hour for the substitute would be all right. Uh, like every other substitute? Yes, sir. We, we would ask for no more than any other substitute. Also, uh, I have it as the town substitute. Is that the proper? It's good, man. Town Schroeder, Mr. Chairman. Town Schroeder? <laughs> That's a new town. <laughs> All right. Coalition pilots. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, let me just. Uh, Make sure that uh, I understand there are only two substantive changes. Uh, one is the, uh, uh, the the Schroeder language, in effect, is being added to H.R. 4000, which was a bill you put out of. Uh, no. no, sir. No? It, it, it accomplishes the same goal, but it does it in a different way. Is that, if, if I may, uh, Mr. Solomon, I it's my understanding that, that uh, Congresswoman Schroeder's language would essentially affect Title VII. This is a separate statute that is a, would propose a separate statute that's exi ex identical, excuse me, to existing law in another area. It, it would accomplish the same goal as that that's desired by my friend from Colorado and my friend from Hawaii, but it would do it right. by going around the other way. Okay, so you have that substantive change, yes. and then you have uh, Mr. Perfumi's uh, language, which is already in the yes, Brooks substitute anyway. So yes, you're just sir. repeating that language in yes, your sir. bill. Yes, and that's the only difference between that and H.R. 4000. That's correct, sir. As reported from the committee, not as passed by the House or right. conference okay. committee and all of that. Okay. And you talked about an amendment when you first started talking, but you mean substitute. Yes, sir. I meant an amendment in the nature of a right. substitute. Okay. I apologize. <clears throat> no further questions. Thanks. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And, uh, Mr. Yeah. If I might be, uh, Mr. Chairman, permitted uh, just another comment. Surely. Uh, we recognize that this approach has been deemed and categorized by some people as unorthodox. And uh, we recognize that we do it without the blessings uh, of the leadership of this House. But many of us, in fact, if not all of us, were not here in 1964 as some of you were when this body came to grips with the great social crises and dealt with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. We may never see in our lifetimes, at least, another opportunity in this House where we might have the opportunity to affect civil rights in such a broad scope. And so for those of us who got here on the backs and through the blood, sweat, and tears of black people and Hispanic people who, in many respects, though they are nameless and faceless, made their bodies bridges that we might run across and one day become members of this body. We just feel that we have a stronger obligation to make sure that we push and fight for the cleanest civil rights bill, the strongest civil rights bill uh, that we could in fact fashion here. And so that is how we have come to this point. Uh, again, I want to add that I appreciate the indulgence of the committee 
and we would certainly uh, hope that you would grant us the right to move this on the floor of the House so that the Congress might, in fact, be able to work its will. Thank you very much, Mr. Performing. Mr. Towns, did you have? Yes. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Towns. I just want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as uh, my colleagues indicated, that we hope that we'll have the opportunity to present this and to give us a chance to uh, uh, vote it on the House floor. We feel very strongly about it. And as uh, Mr. Mfume indicated, that uh, you know this is something that will probably will not come again during our lifetime. And we want to make certain that uh, we do everything possible to let the people know that we are committed to civil rights and uh, in every way. And I think that I'd just like to add to when he said blacks and Hispanics, and I'd also like to add women in this particular instance. I think that's also very important in this case. Thank I'd you like very much. I'd like to thank the panel for an outstanding presentation here today. Thank you very much. <coughs> May we be excused? Yep. Good go. Good go. weekend off. Any other witnesses to testify in this matter? If not, the hearing will be closed. The chair will be in receipt of a motion. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I move the committee grant H.R. 1 a rule providing three hours of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Judiciary Committee. The rule makes in order the Education and Labor Committee amendment in the nature of a substitute now printed in the bill as an original bill for purposes of amendment. The rule makes in order only the following amendments printed in the report to accompany the rule to be considered king of the hill. Only the last substitute adopted will be considered as finally adopted in the following order and in the manner specified in the report. The Town Schroeder substitute, the Michael substitute, the Brooks Fish substitute. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in the report. Find the rule provides for one motion to recommit. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina. Any discussion? Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, I know that uh, people are anxious to get going and, I'm, and my voice is failing, so I'm, <laughs> I won't make the, the obvious argument about the open rule, but uh, at the appropriate time, I really do believe that the House ought to have the opportunity to work its will. You've heard the testimony of even people on your side of the aisle, and um, I, I think we're entitled to it, and uh, at the appropriate time, I will make a motion that we substitute uh, this modified rule uh, with an open rule so that we can have our opportunity on the floor. Okay. Now it's time to make it. What? Well, you, you, you have my, my motion in front of you and my and the copy of the open rule, and I would so move. All right. You've heard the gentleman from New York's uh, motion. Uh, all those in favor of the gentleman from New York's motion will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, I have to ask Mr. for a Sullivan, recorded vote, please. The gentleman asked for a recorded vote. All those in favor of voting for the gentleman from New York's motion will vote aye. When their name is called, those opposed will vote no. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? No. Mr. Bielitsen? No. Mr. Fultz? No. Mr. Bonner? No. Mr. Hall? No. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Chairman? No. <coughs> On this matter, three members have been voted in the affirmative, eight in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Gentlemen, Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I move that the uh, amendments that are contained in the rule be considered as finally adopted. Representative Moorheads to eliminate retroactive application. Representative McCollum's to provide a new remedy for the for on the job harassment with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar damage debt. Mr. Hyde's with the prohibit race norming and test scores, and Mr. Faywell's, which provides that an employer's use of measures of academic achievement or simple presumed to meet the job relatedness requirements be considered on block. You've heard the gentleman's uh, motion. All those in favor of his motion will report aye. 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 Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know. See how persuasive you are? <laughs> Those opposed will say no. 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 The no's have it. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you a chance to uh, reconsider. Yeah, reconsider with a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Garrett. No. 
Mr. Bielens? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bunyan? No. Mr. Hall? No. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? Uh, aye. Mr. McEwen? Yes. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, uh, was the motion that we just voted on, was that to consider these amendments or was that whether or not they would be offered in block? No. No. So your motion? It was considering them in block. Consider them in block. As so the was in the passage. So, so we did consider them in block? Yes. Right. Uh, on this matter. No, no, no. If you, if you could recognize Mr. Uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> this matter, three members have voted the affirmative eight and the negative. The motion, the gentleman, is not adopted. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, many people believe that Congress operates under the, under the uh, system where my members of Congress can stand up and offer amendments to bills on the floor. And they don't understand that unless this committee gives them authority to do that, uh, they merely watch the train. So therefore, there are about seven or four more members of Congress that would like to have the right to present their petition on the floor of the House of Representatives so they can then work its will. And uh, Mr. Faywell uh, has requested and listed in our, on our report amendment number seven. Uh, the definition of business and necessity shall not be construed to exclude the use of subjective evidence. Uh, Mr. Campbell, who would like to vote on the Martin Luther King Wilkes uh, Supreme Court decision and not consider them all in black. Uh, Representative Young of Alaska assures that requirements of bills do not apply retroactively in the Ward's Code situation. And Mr. Grandy, who testified before us, wants to limit the 150000 the total amount of punitive and compensatory damages that could be recovered in, in discrimination cases, excluding any loss of tax pay. And then Mr. Gunderson, who just uh, released provisions assuring attorney fees uh, in specified cases. I repeat, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, it was outlined so well by the uh, our colleague from Alaska, as well as our colleague from Colorado, that the right of the Congress to make its decisions should be made on the floor of the House and they should not be preemptively precluded from making their case uh, before the House, which is what uh, a failure to include them in the rule would do. So I ask your favorable consideration uh, of my request. Of course, the gentleman knows that many of these amendments are in the substitute, but you want them handled individually, is that the case? Uh, it, it, I have no assurances that they're in, in the substitute. I'm delighted to hear that some of them are included. If the substitutes are rejected, uh, they want the right to make it uh, individually. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from Ohio. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 No's <laughs> to have it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. Uh, if I can if I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonner? No. Mr. Hall? No. Mr. Weed? <coughs> Mr. Gordon? Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dryer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, eight members haven't voted in the affirmative, three in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, just the opposite. <laughs> It's a bad day. Well, Three members haven't voted in the affirmative. Eight in the negative. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, Solomon. If I can indulge the uh, committee for just a, two more minutes. Uh, uh, the rule that we have in front of us that we're considering, uh, the last line uh, carries four or uh, five words which say, except one motion to recommit. And there are no uh, further words that say with or without instructions. Uh, normally, it is the minority's uh, historical right and privilege uh, to have the, have the right to have a motion to recommit with instructions. However, because of the way that this rule is constructed, uh, making the education and labor uh, bill as a substitute to the language that came out of the original uh, originating committee, uh, we are precluded from that uh, uh, if it is not specifically written into the rule. Uh, therefore, on behalf of myself and Mrs. Mink and anyone else uh, that would care to join in, uh, I am going to make the motion to, to
to add those words, uh, with or without instructions, uh, to this room. Mr. Chairman, I think that's, that's only fair. It would ordinarily have been uh, that way anyway because of the fairness that you always have, Mr. Chairman, uh, except for this problem of, of substituting the Education and Labor Bill. Uh, and I think that uh, the, all of the people that have testified here, I think they would like to see that. I think everybody on this uh, committee would. So if we're really going to do what we all think we should, then let's vote for my motion. The gentleman knows that when we have substitutes, that the motion to recommit with instructions isn't uh, usually contained in the, in, in the, in the rule. Unless we write it in. I know, but I mean, because we do have the substitutes that, that foregoes the right. need to have a motion to recommit with our instructions. So the, you've heard the gentleman's motion. Uh, on the motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Mr. Chairman, may I please have a recorded vote on that? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielinson. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Yes. Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. McEwen. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, the three members have been voting affirmative and the negative of the motion is not adopted. The question now, any? I was just going to ask, Mr. Chairman, if this passes, uh, uh, when might this be considered on the floor, uh, the rule and the bill itself? It's my understanding that this will be on the floor Tuesday. The rule? Thank you. The rule and the bill. Both. Both. Question comes on the motion, gentlemen from South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted, and the rule will be carried by the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Wheat. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the staff have the right to make technical and conforming changes in the rule passed today. Without objection. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, I just want to point out, even though we had to vote no against the rule, because we really do feel sincerely and conscientiously it should have been an open rule, I do want to thank the majority because uh, uh, you did uh, decide not to make an amendment in order which would have amended the Republican substitute. And uh, because of that, uh, there was some uh, bit of fairness involved, and I want to commend you for it. <laughs> <laughs> a little fairness. A little fairness. Let's hear for fairness the goes a long way. Yeah. Committee enrolls will stand for the I know it's yeah. <laughs> That concludes our coverage of this hearing of the House Rules Committee as the panel met Thursday to discuss procedures for debating the Civil Rights Act. House floor debate on the Civil Rights Bill, originally scheduled for today, has been put off until Tuesday of next week, while members work on bill language concerning hiring quotas. The President has stated that he will veto any Civil Rights Bill if it has quota language. Just ahead, here on C-SPAN. A joint House subcommittee examines the U.S. response to famine in the Horn of Africa. I think today we, in effect, to sort of catch up with the 20th century. We've been the invisible half of the Congress the past seven years. <laughs>